And now I'll just pass it off to, to Sion and you'll get to see the awesome work he's doing. Thanks so much, Owen. That was an awesome presentation. So uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, more on the drug discovery side. So I know Nupra earlier talked about uh, more and more regards of the clinical applications of figuring out which drugs and dosages to go to specific patients. Um, but I'm going to be talking more about the early stage drug discovery efforts and how we can sort of innovate on the research side to actually design more targeted um, small molecule and biological therapeutics for a lot of diseases. So just to give a brief intro about me, I'm currently a senior in high school working on research at the intersection of machine learning, biology, and drug discovery at uh, the University of Toronto. And I'm also on the developer team for DeepChem, which is this project aiming to build scientific machine learning tools for drug discovery based at the Stanford. And my research is supported by the Thiel Foundation through the Emergent Ventures Fellowship. So I'm really excited to get started and talk a little bit about my work. First, to give a little bit more of an um, explanation more about the problem we're facing. If you look at traditional drug discovery today, it's really this $2 billion 12 year pilgrimage that Anupra already talked about. And so you can sort of think of drug discovery as really trying to find a needle in a haystack. We have a huge search space of potential drugs and finding the right ones is incredibly hard to do experimentally to go from figuring out the right target for a drug to then go generate thousands of drugs and test them all in the lab and then optimize them, put them through several rounds of clinical trials can be incredibly time consuming. And I think one thing that's starting to change this is really where machine learning comes in, because it allows us to efficiently find different drug candidates with desirable properties. Like I mentioned before, the therapeutic design space has tens of billions of different compounds, but by leveraging these computational platforms that we're building, we can actually search this space efficiently without having to rely on experimentally validating every single drug. And this is a huge time saver and therefore also a huge cost saver. Um, and by leveraging libraries that many of you in the AI space have probably heard about, like PyTorch or TensorFlow, um, we were actually able to really yield a lot of value with computational tools in this space. And to give a little bit of an intro, I, I think this is not just a space that's heavily theoretical or research driven. There is a ton of AI in, uh, driven investments in AI for drug design, obviously boosted by COVID. So in the last year, uh, there was a 450% increase in investments nearing around 13.8 billion. And there's a ton of uh, really great players in this space, like Recursion Pharmaceuticals or Toronto's own Deep Genomics, um, who are actually bringing drugs into clinical trials and hopefully into patients in the next five to 10 years, as well as many different industrial AI labs like DeepMind and Google. And so I believe what this all really tells us is that with the rise of really powerful computing that we have today through Moore's Law, and a ton of life sciences, genomic and biological data, we really can sort of combine these two to make really powerful impacts in not only furthering our understanding of the human body, but actually furthering our understanding of how to design more multi-targeted therapeutics. And so I'm gonna be talking now about a couple of research projects that I've done to try to tackle this problem. So one project that I worked on was essentially taking a look at uh, essentially the A's, C's, G's, and T's, which are the 3 billion nucleotides that code for the human genome, and basically figuring out ways to embed them and try to predict how likely for a given DNA sequence, whether a protein will bind to that DNA sequence and help transcribe and create RNA. And so really what all we were doing is we were basically converting these uh, genomic data sets into large images and then using leading compu computer vision techniques to try to run these predictions. And by doing this, we're actually able to create these huge mutation maps of large genes, such as the LDR1 gene, which uh, is often known as the cholesterol gene, to try to, for example, target or highlight certain key mutations which may be pathogenic or disease-causing. But after spending around a year working in this intersection in grade 10, I decided to try something really rapidly outside of my comfort zone. And so I interned at a software company called Integrate AI, which is this B2B company building a consumer intelligence platform for our companies in banking and telecom and insurance. And what really was awesome about this internship was I was not only able to learn a lot about theoretical machine learning and what powers things like uh, architectures like Bayesian optimization or gradient boosting machines, but I was able to learn the skills to actually build production level at machine learning, which is something that I know through the layer six talk is something that is obviously a really big component of TD's AI stack. 
And I, I was basically able to learn a lot about the platforms and the infrastructure in Docker and Kubernetes to, to actually take machine learning models and deploy them to users. So building off this knowledge, I was really thinking about how could I take this knowledge that I gained and try to make an impact on accelerating life sciences, uh, life cycles. And so I decided to work on this project called the DeepChem project, which basically on a high level tries to build these high quality tools to really try to democratize the use of deep learning in the life sciences. And so through the deep learning, the deep chem project and library where researchers at companies like Novartis or Carnegie Mellon University are able to look at the different physical properties and predict the physical properties of molecules and actually go through a lot of the, of the things that we would traditionally experiment on and computationally simulate, for example, whether a drug will bind to a target protein. And so this is actually having a huge impact. We've gotten over 500 different academic papers using DeepChem and thousands of researchers across the world which are using the infrastructure. And as I was working on DeepChem, I kept on coming across this problem that, that, that I kept facing, and it was really just the lack of uh, labeled data. And so many of you who work in applied AI can really attest to whether you're trying to predict something like consumer churn or even model biochemical toxicity in a molecule, you don't have a lot of data to work from, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 data points. And that automatically eliminates a lot of deep learning architectures from actually being utilized properly. And so I wanted to try to solve this and see if we could still figure out ways to leverage these really powerful uh, compute intensive architectures. And so I started thinking a lot about transfer learning by essentially figuring out how can we use the huge amount of structural data we have about molecules and proteins in things called virtual libraries and figure out a way to train a, com a, a computer or a machine learning architecture like a transformer to essentially learn to understand chemistry and even speak chemistry in a way. And so I came across the field of natural language processing in which you might've heard of, it's what powers things like Google search and Siri. And I, I came across this architecture by OpenAI that was called GPT-2. And it was actually using this transformer architecture to generate human level text. And so I was thinking, what if we could model chemistry or molecules like a language and try to get it to predict the structure of these molecules or what type of molecule it is to substitute for this lack of data problem that we have. And so I ended up publishing a paper on this that basically looked at applying these transformer architectures in collaboration with a company in Cambridge called Reverie Labs. And what we ended up finding is that by training it to predict different substructures in a molecule and then fine tune it through the process of transfer learning on something like biochemical toxicity or whether a target, whether a target drug will be able to bind to a protein, we were actually able to have a huge boost in our performance by using this strategy in natural language processing. And so in addition to this, I was thinking about how I could try to get my models out to as many people as possible. And this is really where my machine learning engineering background came into play. So I decided to build this set of APIs that would allow you to call the, the, the research models, which are called Kimberta, and basically apply it on a multitude of tasks, like I mentioned before, through the API. So, so far it's received about 250,000 users and we're continuing to scale up the API to hold larger and larger models. And so as sort of a final part of this project that we worked on, we were really thinking about model interpretability. Uh, I think Anupra mentioned before how with a lot of the deep learning models like this, it's really sort of a black box in trying to understand what is this model learning? Is it actually learning a valid representation of chemistry of things like bond placements or whether this can bond to it, whether this atom can bond to another atom? And so what I ended up doing is I ended up building this tool that would visualize the weights of a model to actually figure out what substructures in a molecule this architecture is prioritizing. And so we're hoping to use this in a lot of dr applied drug discovery scenarios to actually go back to people who are like medicinal chemists and validate that our model is actually learning the right things. And so finally, when I, while I was working on, on the DeepChem project, I was also doing an internship at the University of Toronto under Professor Alan Astro Guzik. And so we ended up publishing a paper that essentially highlighted a lot of architectures that are predicting different properties of drugs and talk about how we can overcome uncertainty in these models, which we published in a journal out of Cambridge University. And so sort of concluding, over the past couple of years, I've gotten really the, the, the amazing opportunity to present my work at a ton of amazing conferences at Carnegie Mellon University or NeurIPS and a ton of other conferences where I've met a lot of amazing people and mentors. And I've also been supported by really amazing organizations and groups of people from UFT and 
uh, my former company, Integrate AI, as well as the research fellowship from the Veo Foundation. And so I'm really excited for what the future holds. Um, this summer, I'll be working at a company called Nerex Therapeutics, which is a growth stage biotech company where I'll be essentially designing machine learning models to search this huge vast space of drugs for promising drugs that can degrade protein targets with the goal of creating future cancer therapeutics. And I'm also figuring out where I'm going to go for university, like many other 18 year olds my age, um, and applying to scholarships to help go through that process. But it's been an amazing journey, and I'm really grateful for the people who supported me along the way. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen, and I'd love to answer any questions afterwards if you have any questions about my work. And you can also stay updated on my progress on research by following my Twitter, which is on the bottom left corner. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. A uh, huge round of virtual applause for Anupra, Om, and Sayon. We have a bright, bright future with young leaders like yourselves delving in the AI space.